Excellent. OK, so those of you that joined uh, me last time might remember that we talked quite a lot about um, the role of larvae in wound debridement. And at that session, I introduced larvae and talked about their background and so on. So if you'll forgive me, this time I'm going to dive straight in and talk about the role of larvae in antimicrobial wound care, although we all know that they are absolutely excellent wound debriders um, anyway. So um, when we talk about wound infections, we all know that chronic wounds can be contaminated. All chronic wounds are either colonized or contaminated by microorganisms, but they're not all infected, okay? So infection, again, your experts on this is diagnosed clinically and you look for local and systemic host responses, things like uh, purulent secretions or other signs of infection, such as inflammation or redness um, and so on. And these are indicators that the wound is actually infected. So you can get a local infection like we've got here and you can see that there's um, that, that there's quite a deep ulcer that's infected or you can have a bit more of a widespread wound infection. But again, you're looking for clinical signs that the wound is, is infected. So th the important thing is that if infection is present in a wound, eradicating it is an absolute necessity. Otherwise, the wound will not go on to heal. OK, so it's very important to eliminate the infection. So can larvae then play a role in wound disinfection? I'm going to begin with a pediatric case report. It's quite a traumatic report, but it does uh, illustrate the importance or the use of larvae in this particular scenario. So the case um, was written up by some Polish researchers, some surgeons who talked about a 10 year old boy who was playing with some of those packing straps um, in, in a lorry, or a lorry was stationary, but of course the lorry pulled away and didn't realize that he was under, under the lorry and unfortunately caused a, a, an, an absolutely um, complete trauma traumatic amputation of his left leg and left half of his pelvis. The skin was stripped from the buttocks, the perineum and the lumbar region, and there was great disruption of the urethra at the blood and neck. So the surgeons took him in and did a thorough surgical debridement, removing clothes, removing debris and so on. Um, and then as was the protocol of the hospital, they treated the wound daily with potassium permanganate baths, but also with dressings that were soaked in this antiseptic chlorhexidine. However, by the fourth day, there was a very strong odor and pus, clearly indicative of, of an infection. And when they swabbed, they found a series of, of um, contaminating and, and, and you know, and fungi and bacterial species. So th the boy was put on systemic antibiotics. However, by day 10, there was still extensive necrotic tissue and infection present. This is what he looked like at this stage. And you can see both the necrosis and the infection. So they took him back into surgery and tried to remove some more necrotic skin. However, they couldn't do any more extensive surgical debridement because there was a huge risk due to the nearness of the vital organs, but also of sepsis because there was an infection. So at this point, they initiated maggot therapy. They put eight pots of sterile maggots on, as a single application, so they were free range, and they covered this all, all these maggots up with a, with a fine nylon mesh and a moist gauze. And this is, this is what the, the, the dressing looked like at the time. You'll notice there's some bleeding, and remember, maggots do produce sericase, which is an anticoagulant, so quite often in some wounds there is a bit of bleeding, but it's not um, a, a sign that something's wrong. That's a normal part of the process. So after three days, they took off this dressing and discovered that all the clinical signs of infection had been eliminated. The wound bed was clean, the wound was healthy and beginning to granulate. So at this point, they could do successful skin, um, split skin grafts, and the wound went on to heal completely. And at the time that the authors wrote up this case study, the, the, the lad was waiting for some prosthetic, uh, some uh, prosthetic leg and so on to be fitted. So that's just a case study, which is one example of larval action in an infected wound where systemic antibiotics had been used but weren't clearing the infection. There are, of course, numerous other case studies which report very similar successful outcomes, and I'll be talking about one more uh, a bit later. However, is there any other clinical evidence to support larval antimicrobial action? Is there more robust evidence? Well, 
Randomized control trials, as we know, are the most robust evidence. So I'll just go through a couple of these for you. One in 2016 examined wound disinfection in, in a small cohort, a, a small number, 19 venous leg ulcer patients. And what they did was they compared the use of larvae versus a, a control, a, a, another group which had surgical debridement offered and topical antimicrobial application. In this case, it was silver. The researchers reported a significant reduction in bacterial load in the wounds that had been treated with larvae. And then another study came out in 2019, which actually had a bigger group of patients, 50 patients. Um, and here, these researchers examined the disinfection properties of maggot therapy on diabetic foot ulcers. And they, they put some patients in a control group, and the control group received conventional treatment, surgical, which was surgical debridement and antibiotic therapy and offloading. And some other patients were put in a treatment group where they received maggot therapy in addition to all that. And the researchers concluded, um, oh, sorry, before this, they made a, they, they took a swab and they collected it and looked before and after maggot application for the presence of a couple of species of bacteria, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. They discovered a significant reduction in the numbers of wounds that were infected with Staph after just a single application of larvae. And they also discovered a significant reduction in the numbers of wounds infected with Pseudomonas after two applications of larvae, 96 hours. So it took um, four days rather than the, the 48 hours that staff had been reduced by. Sorry. Um, in the control group, however, where they didn't have maggot therapy, there was no significant reduction in the number of patients with a wound infected with either species of bacteria. So that was quite a significant um, trial. Then another clinical study, and this is, this is the last one I want to report, um, by Polat in 2020, examined the effect of maggots on um, and their secretions on bacteria in open wounds. So what they did was they had 25 wounds from 23 different patients, all of whom had been referred for maggot therapy. And they evaluated, firstly, they evaluated bacterial diversity, again, by taking swabs of the open wounds before maggot therapy and after maggot therapy. So when they isolated bacteria, they found a range of species. You've probably come across all of these and are familiar with all of these. These are wound, wound bacteria. When they uh, had, had finished with the maggot therapy, excuse me, which was usually two to three days later, they took swabs again of the open wounds. And they found that bacterial colonies in the wounds had decreased by between a quarter to three quarters, 25 to 75% for almost all the bacterial species, but especially in wounds infected with Staph aureus and MRSA. In fact, no wounds were left infected um, with, with MRSA. So they concluded that maggot therapy had been responsible for the reductions in active bacterial load of infected wounds. Okay, so what about maggot antibacterial activity? Why would maggots even have antibacterial activity? What, what's in it for them? Well, we know from the last time we talked that larvae in the wild, maggots, are fundamental decomposers. So you have maggots that arrive at a corpse very shortly after the death of the, of the animal or human. Um, but of course, maggots arrive secondarily to bacteria and fungi, which are, of course, primary decomposers. They have already begun work on this particular corpse. So the maggots have to live alongside these other guests at this feast. So they must, they live in completely dirty, filthy environments, contaminated environments where bacteria are all around them. So it makes absolutely se absolute sense that larvae have evolved excellent antimicrobial molecules for their own survival in dead tissue. Nothing to do with what they can do for us. It's just by accident that we've managed to exploit this. They're, of course, looking after themselves because they're going to come across um, bacteria in their environment. So what about the scientific evidence of maggot antimicrobial activity? Do we have any real scientists that have looked for this evidence? And absolutely, yes. We have an abundance of scientific evidence which supports the presence of maggot anti antimicrobial activity. In fact, the early antibacterial mechanisms 
centered around the fact that maggots make a wound a bit more alkaline. And they do this because they secrete ammonia and also calcium carbonate, and all that helps to make a wound a little bit more alkaline and therefore will kill off some bacterial species. And then other researchers suggested, well, it's debridement. You know, they are, after all, digesting the tissue, and therefore when they ingest the soup that they've made back up again, they will digest the bacteria that are present within that soup. And that does happen, and that's been shown to happen too. However, in the last 20 years or so, scientists worldwide have been examining whether larvae can actually secrete antibacterial and antimicrobial product in their saliva and in their secretions and excretions. And in fact, secreted antibacterial activity of maggots has been my main research focus for my research group for the last two decades. So what did we do in Swansea then? Well, we took larvae and we put them in, a, we disinfected larvae, completely sterile that had arrived, and we, we collected their secretions. And you can see here in the test tube, you can see them actually just giving off their secretions as they sit in that, in that tube. When we concentrated that secretion down, it looked a bit like this in an Eppendorf tube. And then we used that secretion to test against various species of bacteria. And if I show you this graph, you'll see that we had a control where bacteria were just allowed to go free and grow freely. And they do following this logarithmic curve. And then when we had maggot secretions in the wells, we discovered that the bacteria flatlined and they couldn't grow at all in the presence of maggot secretions. So we tried this with other species of bacteria. This was Staph aureus. And you can see we tried it with E. coli, we tried it with bacillus species, and we went on, oops, sorry, to try it with a range of different bacterial species, Pseudomonas, C. diff, which you've probably all heard of, which is a notorious anaerobic bacteria, and of course, Mycobacterium, which causes TB. And we discovered that the maggot secretions that we had collected were brilliant at eradicating or killing all those, all those um, um, bacteria in vitro. Then we tried it with MRSA, and again, we got an excellent flatlining of the growth of MRSA in the presence of, of maggot secretions. So then Princess of Wales Hospital got in touch with me and said, well, look, we've got 15 clinical isolates of MRSA. Could you please test those against your maggot secretions? And so we did. And we found that the maggot secretions stopped, inhibited the growth and killed 12 out of those 15 species of MRSA. And that was significant because it didn't work against all 15, which shows us clearly that it's not just like a bleach effect or an alkaline effect. There's clearly an antibacterial factor which is destroying certain species of bacteria. So we tried to identify and characterize this fact a little bit more. We simply took the maggot secretions and passed them through a series of sieves or filters, ultra fil filters, which separated out the molecules depending on their size. And we discovered that the tiniest sized molecules were in fact where the secretion, where the activity was within the maggot secretion. So all that tells us is we've got very, very small molecules that are killing MRSA within the maggot secretion. So we've been investigating for some considerable time the identity and the mode of action of this very small maggot antibacterial compound, which has been trademarked as ceratocin. How does ceratocin work? Well, we've looked at the mode of action to see what exactly it can do on the bacteria. How is it killing them? Well, when we incubated ceratocin with bacteria, we found lots of different morphological effects. The bacteria changed shape. They changed their, their whole being. So we looked at Bacillus series and E. coli. And when you look at B. series, this is how it replicates, it divides. So it forms uh, a bacteria, and when it's in an ideal wound situation, for example, it'll divide and get more and more and more. And each one of these little pieces of bacteria will replicate again and again and again. But when you incubate it with the maggot extracts, you don't get the division. You get these elongated bacteria, which are totally useless, totally functionless, can't divide, just stretchy. In fact, 17 times longer than what the bacteria is supposed to be, but completely functionally unviable, useless bacteria. So the same thing happened with E. coli. When we incubated E. coli with this maggot extract, we got these weird lemon-shaped bacteria emerging and racket-shaped bacteria, completely mismorphing and, and, and um, changing the shape of these, actual, these bacterial cells. 
So we sent some of our serratids in to San Diego, a company called Linus Bioscience, and we asked them to look at it, to try and tell us what was going on. And what they discovered, they, they um, exposed our maggot secretion to E. coli and various dilutions of the serratid extract, uh, the maggot extract. And they discovered that only at 10% of this extract, they found exactly what we had shown, really, really long cells with regular space nucleotides, no, not functional at all, but at 50% of the extract, they got complete cell lysis. So that showed them that the seratin maggot isolate had actually effect, affected the bacterial cell wall division. And that's one of the most important things that bacteria have in their, in their replication um, portfolio. They have to divide uh, to survive and to create an infection. So the maggot antibacterial seratin does, in fact, inhibit that. Um, it interacts with the bacterial cell division and therefore it stops the cell division and kills the bacteria. So that's how that little part of the maggot anti antimicrobial activity works. What about other maggot antimicrobial research? Well, several scientists have confirmed the presence of a numerous antibacterial peptides against both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And this is all published in the literature. In fact, in 2010, a very significant discovery was made by Sarovsky, who discovered a large antibacterial peptide, which he called lucifensin, which is very much present in maggot secretions. And then in 2015, Anna Katrina Popple, some German researchers, looked and discovered that maggots possess the genes which can encode for 47 different antimicrobial peptides. This German group actually created 23 of them and found that they're active against a range of bacteria. So maggots have a tremendous potential for making antimicrobial peptides. What about bacterial biofilm? Now we know that biofilm is actually quite a notorious um, infection within several chronic wounds. So do maggots, do larvae have any effect on bacterial biofilm? Sorry, going backwards. Um, well, we know that biofilm actually forms when wound bacteria aggregate to form a very tough resistant layer. And this layer is embedded in a complex mixture of all sorts of things, which strengthens the bacterial presence within the wound. Biofilm is notoriously difficult to treat and eradicate. The, the biofilm can't be treated with antibiotics and the host immune response can't attack biofilm. So once it's there in a wound, it's really, really tough and very hard to get rid of. What happens is that planktonic individual bacteria sit together on a wound and then they think oh I know let's form like a wall to make ourselves a little bit more protected and they do that by multiplying and making this this extracellular polymer wall like a cement around them okay and that's known as the biofilm and you can see the biofilm here the bacteria are embedded well within it but creating this wall around them so that they're extremely well defended. And if you looked under um, an electron microscope, you, this is Staph aureus, you can see the, the biofilm here. But if you look really close, you can actually see the layers almost of cement, of biofilm that are sealing that, those bacteria together and protecting um, those bacteria. In wounds, of course, we know that it occurs quite severely and can be responsible for stalling healing in, in several chronic wounds. So what about biofilm and maggot secretions? Well, at Swansea, we decided to investigate whether maggot secretions could disrupt bacterial biofilm. We used two strains of Staph epidermidis, um, and they have different adhesion mechanisms, so they create biofilm in slightly different ways on a wound. Um, so what we did was we made a culture of these bacteria and we put them in, in plates like that. And to some of those plates, as soon as we would put the bacteria in, we added maggot secretions immediately to see if there would be any effect on the formation of a biofilm within that bacterial culture. And then to some of it, some wells, we actually let the, the biofilm grow for 24 hours, so it formed, then we added the maggot secretions to see if there was any effect of maggot secretions on preformed biofilm, okay? And then we let everything grow a little bit longer. We incubated everything to make sure that it had chance to form the biofilm if it was going to. And then we analyzed the biofilm to see what had happened. Well, we found that the maggot secretions destroyed the preformed biofilms. So you had a massive decrease in the formation of biofilm and the preformed biofilm, complete destruction of it once you added the maggot secretions. 
But not only that, we found that when you added maggot secretions before you allowed the biofilm to form, you actually prevented the formation of the biofilm as well. So that was really very interesting that you can actually get a prevention of biofilm formation if you have the maggot secretions in, 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 in the assay. So we then went on to, to looking at what was present in the larval secretions that could be affecting the biofilm formation. And at that time, we were working closely with Professor David Pritchard in Nottingham, who said, well, I've got uh, an, an artificially created, and I talked about this last, last time with you, a maggot chymotrypsin, an enzyme in the maggots. Let's see, he said, why don't you have a look and see if that affects your biofilm formation? So we did. And we looked at this, this strain of Staph and we found that David's chymotrypsin destroyed the biofilm here. We also found it destroyed it in the other species. Um, we didn't find that it destroyed it in Staph aureus, and there's something else within maggot secretions, not the recombinant chymotrypsin, that might be disrupting established biofilm of Staph aureus. However, we did report this result because it was quite clear that the Staph epidermidis couldn't form um, its biofilm, or in fact it broke up, in the presence of maggot chymotrypsin. Um, so what else do we know about biofilm and larval secretions? Recently, there's been the discovery of an enzyme. This enzyme is called DNAs, which is produced and secreted by larvae. Again, this is the work of Professor David Pritchard in Nottingham. So let me explain this a little bit. When, you, when, when a single little bacteria here with its friends decide that it's going to make a biofilm, here's the biofilm, okay? Sometimes you've got more than just one species of bacteria, lots of different, um, it, it could be a polymicrobial community that's growing within, within this biofilm. But in order to form, this biofilm needs quite a lot of different things. And one of the things it needs is this guy here, extracellular DNA, all right? Well, what is extracellular DNA? Extracellular DNA is something that the bacteria must have to build their biofilm. However, DNA can be broken down by the enzyme DNAs. And what David discovered is that larvae secrete this enzyme, this DNAs, and this DNA degrades bacterial DNA, so there's no no DNA kicking around for the bacteria to use to make their own biofilm. And it also degrades the host DNA, the DNA from, let's say, the venous leg ulcer or the slough, which, again, very clever bacteria were going to use to make their biofilm. All right. Larvae secrete this enzyme. So that can't happen. And what David showed very neatly was that he created a Pseudomonas um, uh, arginosa biofilm and he untre untreated, you've got the biofilm, so you can see that there. Okay, that's the biofilm. Then he added larval secretions and he found that the biofilm was disrupted. And when he added DNAs on its own, maggot DNAs, he discovered that they couldn't, they couldn't form anything. There was no biofilm formation whatsoever. Okay, so enzymes in maggot secretions can destroy both formed biofilm and can also prevent its formation. And we know that larvae are often used to remove wound biofilm. So when I was doing this work in Swansea, I was working with a consultant microbiologist who got really excited at the fact that maggots, pre-incubating maggots on something, stopped the biofilm from forming. And he was really interested because he always discovered that things like catheters and uh, other things like heart valves and shunts tended to fail because they became infected with, with a biofilm. So he wondered whether we could bathe these things in maggot secretions before implanting so that they might actually prevent biofilm formation. And sure enough, Kazander, Gwendolyn Kazander in 2010, grew Pseudomonas biofilm on these sort of surfaces, these sort of implant surfaces, polyethylene and titanium um, and stainless steel, all these sort of materials materials that are used to make um, these things. And he incubated, um, Gwendolyn incubated um, these, this, this biofilm with maggot secretions. And what she saw was a 92% reduction in biofilm formation with maggot secretions. She also found very similar results with staph biofilm. And more recently, researchers um, in China um, have isolated a different extract from dried Lucilia larvae. Um, it's called a fatty acid extract, and this has been found to prevent biofilm formation of Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pneumoniae, and also eradicate preformed biofilms of these bacteria. So there's hosts of things going on uh, in terms of anti-biofilm activity of larvae.
A quick word about Pseudomonas wound infection. You probably all know as clinicians that Pseudomonas is probably one of the hardest things that you can treat in a wound. It's a, a very nasty bacteria, but also maggots don't appear to work very, very well within a Pseudomonas um, wound infection. The wound infections are notorious. Maggots can't always eradicate them. And in fact, in many cases, the maggots themselves are killed in heavily con uh, colonized wounds with Pseudomonas. Um, and, and what happens here is Pseudomonas actually start to make a biofilm. And they, to do that, they communicate with each other, they talk to each other. And the way that they do that, chatting, is through quorum sensing molecules, special little molecules that help them to create this, this biofilm. So here are the pseudomonas, planktonic pseudomonas, and there they are having chatted with each other through their quorum sensing molecules and making this embedded biofilm um, structure, this warp. The quorum sensing molecules actually also regulate the production of how virulent that pseudomonas, how, how pathogenic that pseudomonas is going to be. And that's regulated by virulence factors. And a group in Denmark discovered that it's these factors, these virulence factors, that are toxic to maggots and will kill them. And this was published in 2010 by Anderson, who led this research. Um, and if you want to find that paper, it's a really brilliant paper to read. But basically, what they've suggested is because of this virulence factors of Pseudomonas, the, the way you can overcome the killing effect of these factors on maggots is to increase the numbers. So where you've got heav heavily colonized wounds, just put far more maggots on than you were, were going to. And that should uh, eliminate this pr problem with the virulence factors. And then we come to another point. Is maggot antibacterial activity that I've just talked about, all these various things, is it inducible? Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at us. We are fighting fit, healthy, wonderful individuals, okay? Now, as we are fighting fit and healthy, we, we don't have an infection, but our immune system is keeping everything, it's on the boil very, very low. It's like simmering and it knows that it's there if it ever needs us, okay? But it's, but it's not gonna be coming and to play in great force because we don't need it. We're healthy, fit, fantastically um, wonderful individuals. When we do get ill, when you get a virus or a bacterial infection and it overtakes your body, that's when your immune system thinks, whoa, you know, this, is, this isn't very good. I'm going to up my game a bit. And your immune system is induced to big up its, itself and make itself respond greatly. And the way it does that, your body responds by increasing your numbers of immune cells so they can fight the, the, the bad bacteria or the bad viruses. And your body also responds by increasing secreted defenses. So it's not just cells it increases, it increases secretions like antibodies. So they then can act on these nasty little bacteria and get rid of them. OK, so in much the same way, when you've got a lovely, healthy, clean, sterile, disinfected load of maggots, they've got a little bit of uh, antimicrobial defense, but not a lot because they don't need it. They're surrounded by cleanliness. But the minute you put them into a, a, a nasty environment where there's, where there's dirt, there's infection, perhaps a chronic wound, an infected chronic wound, the minute you put them in that sort of environment, Will they big up their antimicrobial activity? Will they be induced to produce more um, antibacterial factors? And in fact, a few researchers have in fact looked at inducible maggot antibacterial activity. And in 2007, the very first person, Huberman, showed that maggots were taken from chronic wounds, showed a three to six times increase in antimicrobial activity than disinfected maggots. And then other researchers in 2010 incubated larvae with bacteria, so a couple of hours surrounded by bacteria, and then they took those maggots, washed them, homogenized them, and they found that those larvae had significantly elevated antibacterial activity compared to mash extracts of disinfected larvae. In 2012, some other researchers actually did it with Pseudomonas for two hours and then collected those maggot secretions. And they actually found that when they tested them, there was a significant effect in preventing biofilm formation from those larvae that had been incubated with Pseudomonas than those that had been collected, than the secretions that had been collected from sterile larvae. And they did this in a dose dependent manner. So they incubated with a few Pseudomonas then a bit more, then a bit more. And they found that as more Pseudomonas were surrounding the bacteria, they were producing way more antibacterial factors to stop the biofilm formation. So that's really interesting. Clearly maggot antibacterial activity is inducible.
I'm going to finish the antibacterial section with a case study, and then I'm going to quickly go on to two minutes on antifungal and antiviral activity. I won't be long now at all. I'm conscious it's half seven. So let's talk about this maggot antibacterial case study. This was reported a 54 year old man who had diabetes. He had a small non healing wound on the first toe of his left foot. That underwent amputation of that toe because it, it wasn't healing. But unfortunately, he had he developed a surgical wound infection, which was um, infected with Staph aureus. And that infection began to spread to his lower left leg. And he had to have that lower limb amputated. Unfortunately, the stump became severely infected with what we call wet gangrene. Now, again, you know that gangrene, and this was the wound, this was the stump with its gangrenous infection. And gangrene is a bacterial infection, wet gangrene. And it usually is a condition that necessitates amputation, usually up to the upper part of, of, the, of the limb. However, the surgical team debrided the remaining tissue and discovered that there was very poor vascularization. The patient had diabetes. So the patient did not receive systemic antibiotic therapy, and instead they initiated maggot therapy. They discovered that the local in inflammation rapidly decreased and the condition of the, the leg improved within one week. Signs of the infection subsided and the wound showed signs of granulation. And here you can see maggots had been applied again free range directly to the wound surface that the wound is being cleaned up really incredibly. That's a gangrenous wound a week ago. They carry on treating for a couple of weeks, they use PVA foam and so on. And finally, um, after several weeks with, with negative pressure therapy as well, the wound was covered with a mesh graft transplant and the patient discharged after five weeks. Um, four months following discharge, the patient could walk with a prosthesis and after a year follow up, there was no signs of reinfection. And that's the stump after one year. So great, antibacterial activity is very, very much present within maggot secretions. And I'm going to finish off with antifungal activity. Do larvae possess antifungal activity? Now, not so critical for wounds, although we are seeing more and more wounds with having, having um, fungi uh, within them rather than bacteria. But we in Swansea decided to look to see whether maggot secretions produced any antifungal activity. And we discovered that they did. Completely distinct activity from the seratocin that we identified, although this, this maggot antifungal activity is also a tiny little molecule. So what we did, we, we grew up candida in, a, in an agar plate. You can see all the colonies of candida, albicans growing here. And then we grew it up in the presence of maggot secretions, and you can see very few growing up. And then we grew it up in the presence of our isolated fraction of fungal activity. And again, you can see nothing. The candida couldn't grow at all in the presence of that antifungal factor. We also tried it against spores of various other species of fungi. And you can see here, whereas the control germinated in the presence of the maggot antifungal factor, we had very little, um, hardly any germination whatsoever. Um, another group um, of researchers, again, the German group of Poppel, uh, discovered a maggot antifungal compound in a recent study. They've called this compound leucomycin. It's a novel antifungal peptide and shows activity against lots of different species of fungi. So that's very much present too. Clinical evidence of antifungal um, activity. Let's just review this, this case study very, very quickly. This was a healthy 21-year-old male who had a devastating conveyor belt injury to his upper left arm, upper left extremity, his hand. He had um, initial surgical debridement, but when they cultured his wound, they sh it showed bacterial colonization. So it was started with antibiotic treatment, um, but, uh, and this was his hand, uh, two days after surgical debridement. Now at this point, the, um, the, the wound was cultured again and it revealed an opportunistic fungal infection, okay? Um, and they started antifungal treatment with itraconazole. However, this did not control the fungal infection. So at this point, they started maggot therapy. Remember, this is to treat the fungal infection that wasn't being controlled. The surgeons decided to put three bags, three bio bags um, of maggot therapy, and they did this for two applications. And by then, they'd achieved a significant improvement in the wound condition. They found that the maggots removed all the necrotic tissue. And upon swabbing, they discovered that there was no mycotic infection, no fungal infection um, at all. And it had been eradicated. And then five weeks later, they did skin grafts and performed and so on, and no infection relapses occurred. And this was six months follow up. Okay, I'm going to finish off with antiviral activity, the very topical 
uh, um, area of antiviral activity. Well, could it be possible that maggots possess antiviral activity? Well, Recently, a, a, a couple of papers have come out by a group of researchers who tested whole body extracts of various maggots, including cilia, and they found activity, of course, against bacteria and fungal species, which we know we've established, but they also additionally investigated antiviral activity. They started off by testing maggot extracts against herpes simplex, and you know, remember herpes simplex is the, the virus that causes cold sores, and they also looked at two other viruses, Rift Valley fever as well, and, and Cocaxi virus, okay? And they looked at these and they found potent, anti potent antiviral activity in maggot secretions against all these viruses. And that's a very topical and very paramount discovery. Um, obviously that needs to be looked at in more detail. And if anybody's interested, we should look to see whether maggot secretions are active against COVID. And I believe that's actually being looked at anyway at the moment. And so let's summarize this marathon session. Larvae secrete a range of antimicrobial factors. Those are antibacterial, they're antibiofilm, they're antifungal, and they're antiviral. But remember, when you put larvae on a wound, they act like little factories, producing the whole array of antimicrobial molecules as and when they need them. And if the wound is chronically infected, they will up their game to produce more because they are inducible. And that is the end of the seminar. Thank you very much indeed for listening.